All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, let me uh, get us into our project. Uh, don't feel too bad about furiously writing notes. Everything is on a GitHub. So just you get the GitHub link uh, and you're golden. So let me get into our PowerPoint. Uh, and for those of you who want to find the GitHub, uh, I think that realistically the easiest thing to do is just to go to github.com slash moco makers. That's what I recommend. Hmm? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, if you could please. Thank you. Um, all right, so you're at the uh, GitHub Moco Makers, and it's this Comfy UI workflow. It's the latest repo. Um, it will have our PowerPoint right here. Uh, all of the demos that we're going to go through are in this workflows. Uh, and then supporting documentation, which is commonly missing from websites that cover these topics, we've got it. So you'll, you'll, you'll have everything you need. Uh, I'll go ahead and get us into our presentation. So uh, thank you uh, to uh, uh, Itai for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Matthew Zamora, the organizer for Moco Makers. And uh, I've been using Comfy UI for about nine months. Uh, it's been around for I, at, least, uh, at least a year. Um, it, it came out pretty early. In the uh, bad old days, uh, you know, you had things like Stable Diffusion, and it was command line driven. And most people are still using command line driven. You're either using a website that, you know, somebody took, uh, solved the command line issues for you, or you're you're doing command line. There really wasn't a happy medium for, uh, you know, uh, low code, no code, mom and pop. You know, I just want to do it myself styles. That's that is also where the Comfy UI came in. So. Um, I wanted to just go ahead and, and jump on in to, to show you. We'll, we'll go into the theory uh, uh, shortly, but just to give you the, the raw flavor it right off the bat. Um, all right, so first thing is launch Anaconda. Uh, I'll go into the install instructions. So this, is, this is just to quickly get us in. So go ahead and go into your uh, Comfy UI folder. Uh, activate your virtual environment. And go ahead and run the main uh, Python, main.py. All right. Um, let me make sure I am plugged in. Uh, there, this is a uh, graphics card intensive. It is. It is um, not as platform agnostic as you might hope. In, in theory, yes, it can run on Linux, it can run on Windows. The limiting modifier is your graphics card. So what I'm going to recommend is you need to have a CUDA graphics card. So if, if you have CUDA, you're good. Um, you can run, um, you can run uh, AMD graphics card, but only in Linux. That's what I've heard, but I haven't tested that. I, I've just heard that. All right, so this is the primary interface. Um, and uh, first of all, you need a mouse. You need a third, a third uh, scroll wheel uh, for this. Uh, and uh, what, uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated. You wanna scroll in this part. Um, if you change the size, there's weird things that happen uh, to the side window. So just you know, control where you're scrolling to this main part. Uh, fundamentally, it is a uh, nodes-driven design. So anybody who's ever done uh, graphic-based game development, this is very similar to that, or any kind of workflow development, frankly, all very similar. Uh, you're starting over here with a, a checkpoint. A checkpoint is stable diffusion, but it's stable diffusion that has been selected for a certain level of quality. Uh, we'll go into that in more detail. You have a positive prompt and a negative prompt, uh, you can set up some baseline of what you want uh, the output image to be as far as the, the, the width, the height, 
also how many versions of that image. Uh, and then there is something that processes it. There's something called a seed, which is basically the random number that you use to, to, to base everything off of. Um, my recommendation is to use a fixed seed, meaning that every time you run it, you create the same output. This is going to allow you to modify your um, image in small iterative steps. So like, oh, I love everything but the clouds. Let me change the color of the clouds. Like if I have the same seed, run the exact same prompt, I'll get the same image, except for that one tweak of like, maybe I say make the clouds brighter or something. Uh, and then something that's encoding and decoding, uh, and then the previewer. So what happens, you'll go ahead and queue this. You can click view queue, see that it's running. It will show you what it's stepping through with this green outline, which is really great. And then behind the scenes, it's doing a bunch of stuff. And this is the part where you want to have a, a graphics card and you're gonna wanna have that processing. Now, um, this is pretty quick. This is done already. Um, so this was designed as a 500, 12 by 512 pixel image. Uh, that is the heart of it, right? So what we're talking about, our prompt was beautiful scenery, nature, glass bottle landscape, purple galaxy bottle, kind of weird airy stuff. And if I want to change the seed, I'll change it just a few clicks, cue it again. And it's, it's the same concept, different image. Uh, and so what you can do is with the batch size, you can have you know, a, a, a set of these designed all at once. So if you, you just wanna, you know, brainstorm and see a lot of variations, you can just run a larger batch, uh, get a bunch of options here um, and, you know, just, uh, you know, think about what, what you want and maybe pick one and, and move forward with that. So we'll go into all that coming up, but I wanted to give you that baseline uh, premise on, on uh, uh, the comfy UI. All right, so um, again, this is the link for the repo. Uh, if you uh, catch nothing else, catch this link because it has the slide deck as well as the code examples. Uh, and the code examples has settings that are non-obvious. Like you're not going to be able to recreate my results unless you also recreate every single setting. So I recommend you use the, uh, the files that I, I, I attach because that, that is a lot of the nuance here is that there's a lot of parameters how do you tweak them? There's a, it's art, not science. All right, so let's cover some hard-earned foundational concepts, things that'll set you up for success. Uh, we're talking about a uh, image generation based on large language model technologies. Well, what is a large language model? Large language model uh, is a, a digestion of all kinds of source of text documents and then creating relationships between the words of those text documents. So clouds and sky have a relationship. This is how much they have a relationship. Clouds and skies and balloons also have a relationship. And you're building these associations between objects. Now, because that, that was the foundation of large language models is you're creating associations and relationships. You can see how, uh, how uh, uh, weather reports have described uh, skies, and you can see how, uh, um, you know, uh, science fiction artists have described apocalyptic skies or whatever. Like you have a lot of contexts where skies uh, have been described in your corpus of, of materials, all, all the literature that was originally digested. Um, now, it's, a, it's an easy step from that into image generation. And the easy step is because you can take an image and you can tag it and say, this is a picture of a cat, that's a picture of a cat, that's a picture of a dog, that's a picture of an airplane. So those tags are converted to language, the, 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 the keyword, uh, and then you can run it basically through your large language model. You can get those same relationships, all the advantages of those relationships into an association of images. You're saying these images represent these keywords, and when I'm describing to you in a text, give me a picture of, uh, a balloon in the sky at night, um, it knows what those things are, it finds the images in its, its the image corpus, uh, and then it can recreate those images for you. Fundamentally, we're talking about generative AI. Generative AI is a, uh, generally you have a, uh, a uh, generation model, a model that's like, hey, is this something? Is this something? Is this something? 
and then you have a scoring and validation model, and they're antagonistic against each other. They're, they're kind of fighting it out, or technically they're cooperating. You'll say, this is a picture of a cat, and the scoring model says, no, that's not a cat. Well, well this is a picture of a cat. Oh, yeah, that, that's sort of a cat. You know, this is a picture of a cat. Yeah, that's what it is. And so they can reinforce each other and kind of train to get you to something. Um, so that's fundamentally generative AI. It is uh, described as a stochastic uh, technique, which means you, you, you start with kind of random uh, fuzzy data, and then you kind of refine the fuzziness into an image. Um, now, uh, there are a lot of literature. And this, this, just to set the tone, this is not a science talk. This is a practical talk. This is how you would use it. Look at the literature for um, the bigger details here. But I, there, there are some things about this that's important to know. When you are training your images and those keywords, uh, how are they doing it? Well, you generally, you're going to have, uh, this, is, this is where stable diffusion came in. Uh, they took the effort to download the billion images or however many images. I, I don't actually know their total count, but the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of images perhaps, uh, and all the associated tagging and keywords. They're the ones that did that. And that first training was massive. That was a huge financial investment. That's not something we can recreate. But what they did is they trained it and released the model open source. Now, now that it's open source, uh, there are layers that people are building on top of that base trained model that are improving it. And that's where the checkpoints come in, which we'll get into later. We're starting from the checkpoints. We're starting from a sliver of what was originally trained, all of those billions of images, uh, a, a sliver that is still representative of most of the vocabulary of the English language. Now, when those images were trained and added to the corpus, uh, they were trained at 512 by 512 resolution. Um, you know, generally there's an automated ingestion script um, and they're going to take an image, resize it, crop it, and standardize and just be aware of the fact that um, most of the stable diffusion images were trained on 512 by 512, which means that if you draw a picture, uh, if, if the example I have here is if, if you ask for a picture of one person, if, you, if it's 512 by 512, it'll probably fit one person pretty well in that. But if you have something that's double wide and you ask for one person, you might introduce an artifact of having two people. Right, So it took the concept of a person, it gave you the concept of a person, but it had this extra space it didn't know what to do with, so it gave you a concept of a person. Right, like it's, uh, It introduced an artifact because it was biased to that 512 by 512 original concept. Now, um, what I have here are some just you know, rough recommended sizes. You can, you can actually go beyond this. A lot of this can, you know, it's a trial and error thing. So like, can you run a... Uh, 720 by 1080 pixel uh, image, of course you can. Uh, but this is what I recommend uh, for the comfy UI. And, and the trick here is that uh, you, what you want to do is you want to start with a small one and then use a, an upscaler to get to 4K. So you, you, you get this original image at the small resolution and then you run it through an upscaler and that'll make it whatever size you want. And it'll, it, the upscalers are very uh, good at what they do. Um, so there's a bunch of terminology, checkpoints, pickles, safe sensor, VAE, LoRa, VAE, embeddings. Uh, let's get into it. So these are, this is again, the caveat here is that these are informal definitions. There is actual, you know, difficult reading matter on each of these that I'm not going to get into. But as far as this, in the context of comfy UI, this is what these things mean. So a checkpoint is a modified version of stable diffusion trained on a subset of images that generally select for quality or aesthetic over the broad coverage of keywords that was in the original training set. So you can get checkpoints that are really good at humanoids. You can get checkpoints that are really good at uh, hyperrealism. You can get checkpoints that are really good at Cartoons. You can get checkpoints of all kinds of uh, emphases. And if you think of the full scope of the original stable diffusion, uh, the point of the checkpoint is to drill down. And generally, what they're going for is quality, right? So, whereas the original image set had 
uh, high resolution images of humans and low resolution images of humans, a person might subselect for just the good resolution versions of humans. Now, when you, when you try and create a new human, uh, it's going to be better quality. You're just going to get better results by starting with a checkpoint than starting with the original uh, stable diffusion. But it basically is stable diffusion. So these, these are, uh, by the way, the whole premise of Comfy UI, you're running it locally. Um, so on, on, on a laptop, that's kind of the, some of the quirky fun, uh, uh, one of the reasons you would want to do this is that you're running it locally. After you download the models, you can run this fully offline. You don't need any connection. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the cool things. Um, so other terminology, just to continue, pickle, safe sensors. Uh, these are uh, formats for sharing files. Uh, files, generally, these are like models. So for example, um, you're downloading a model that represents every image that was ever trained. Uh, the models, when we're talking about the checkpoints, it's like six to eight gigabytes, which to me was shockingly small. Right, every there's a picture in there for every English word you can think of. Six to eight gigabytes represents that. Now, again, it's not representing um, pixels. It's representing a model, which is a trained weights and values association uh, data structure. Uh, so there is efficiency in, in sharing models versus the original corpus, which was maybe petabytes of data. Uh, but what we're sharing when we when we actually are going to train these things on a laptop, six to eight gigabytes, not too bad. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons why we have uh, generative AI now, not ten years ago, because our hardware caught up to what we need to run these things in practical terms on practical machines. So a, an eight gigabyte file can load into your RAM now. But 10 years ago, you know, very few people could do that. So that's, that's kind of one of the premises here that you know, we have hardware that matches what people want to be doing uh, with the, these models. Um, other fun buzzwords, VAE, uh, they work with encoding, decoding of images in a latent space. Uh, these are types of models. Uh, these are a type of model. So let me, let me, let me sw switch back to um, the... Uh, page for a second, just to, just so we're tracking along. This is the checkpoint, right? So you have these options you can select from. This is the base thing, right? We're jumping now over to VAE, and you, you, call it, you see it's a decoder. So you have these prompts going into some kind of weird model thing, and then you have a decoder. So what happens is this image, as it's processing, isn't, it's represented in this latent space, uh, which is just a funny word for saying, data structure that's generic and is easy to do math on. Um, and uh, so the VAE is for encoding and decoding of images. OK. LoRa. Uh, LoRa is really important as an artist, uh, something I'm really going to highlight in our demos. They represent a style of art. So for example, if you, if you want to see a picture of the Eiffel Tower, in the style of Picasso's Starry Night. You can kind of imagine what that would look like. There's the Eiffel Tower. Behind it are the blue and yellow swirls uh, representing the star Starry Night. So the concept of a style is captured in a LoRa. LoRa is a, it's a small file. Could be, uh, could be uh, one megabyte. Uh, could be up to, up to a gigabyte. It, it can be bigger. Uh, but it could be as small as one megabyte representing a style. Uh, and so what's really cool with these is that you can, you can uh, train a LoRa on as few as 15 to 30 images. And time permitting, I'll, in this presentation, I will try and uh, demo that. Or if not, it's, it's in the notes on, on the slide deck. Uh, but basically, the concept here is that you can, uh, you can represent the style of something. You can capture the essence of its style um, in a small selection of images, training, training it into a small file, and then using that file essentially as a filter uh, that will recreate that style for whatever positive and negative prompt you, you use after that. Um, embeddings, uh, a, a last buzzword we'll go into. Um, 
Generally, embeddings are models that tweak the generative scoring of prompts. And again, embeddings in data science means a lot of things. I'm talking about embeddings in the context of Comfy UI. Um, so for example, uh, most embeddings are used in the negative prompt. Uh, so for example, this is an embedding here, this including the parentheses, negative underscore hand is an embedding. And if you add this embedding to your negative prompt, it will fix ugly hands. So this was a model that was trained to fix ugly hands. Uh, and that, and that, that in this terminology is called an embedding. All right, so um, I also, it, it, it's good to get a sense for the ecosystem players here. Um, so um, who's involved in this space? And it's broader than this. We're, we're really in a renaissance of like file sharing websites and communities and such, but these are big players. Um, Hugging Face, uh, if you haven't heard of it, is for, it's like GitHub, but for AI models, not just art, all of the AI models. Um, it lets you download, they, they do free hosting, one of the cool things about Hugging Face is that for some of their larger models, they'll actually let you demo the model on the web app. Um, so they do, they, they spend a lot of money on like uh, huge GPU farms and they just let you use it for free. Um, but um, they're, they're basically like GitHub. Um, Citiv AI uh, lets you download most of the checkpoints that we're gonna use as well as LoRa's. Uh, and then of course, Comfy UI. Now Comfy UI, and third-party nodes. Uh, this is Comfy UI is all third-party stuff, right? It's 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 uh, developers for developers. Um, and um, let me let me take you through some um, more practical examples. I'm going to hop over to the Moco Makers uh, GitHub. There is this required downloads, and when you when you one of the biggest and most frustrating parts of uh, learning Comfy UI is you find pretty pictures and you find demos online. They'll give you the, the workflow and the workflow is this. It's, it's, it's a set of nodes and how they're linked and what the weights and values are. You can, you can actually just save this as a .json file. Um, they give you that, but then they don't give you these things, which are the actual models you need. Um, and uh, you know where do you get those models from? Well. I solved that, I give it to you, here it is. These are the checkpoints that we're using in our talk, the VAEs, some custom nodes. Uh, I'll get into this shortly, LoRa's, embeddings. Um, I'm giving you, so these are relevant. If you wanna recreate my talk, you have to download these things and put them in the relevant place, which, which I'll get into shortly. But I wanted to go through some of these things to give you a sense for these, these websites, because again, these communities are very important to understand. This is an example of hugging face. So you'll see that it is like GitHub. There's a, this is the Stability AI's uh, project. And then inside of it, this is one of their repositories or something. Um, generally, they'll have a model card where they describe a lot of stuff. What we're looking at when, you, when, when you're digesting and absorbing this is you wanna go to the files and versions, and you're gonna wanna download the, the, the model exactly as it's called exactly as it's called generally speaking either here or or um, wherever else it, it appears uh, certainly uh, I call it out in uh, here which one you need so you need this one for example and again there's that dot safe tensors uh, by the way um, just to circle back to the difference between pickles and tensors this is a pickle Pickle is a Python format for storing arbitrary data structures that are shareable. Um, pickles are older. Pickles were invented with, they're, they're part of like Python core. Um, they're being superseded by safe tensors. And the reason is because pickles can hold malware. If you're downloading from a reputable like uh, repo, like stable stability AI, you're fine. But if, if it's like, you don't know who this person is, safe tensors is safer. Um, it's essentially supposed to be malware proof at least for now. <laughs> um, it's an arbitrary data structure. What it really is, is a model. And what is a model? A model tends to be a uh, something like a text file. 
Uh, it's, it's not really text because it's, it's, it's already in an object format, but it tends to be a bunch of relationships. So A 1.0 B, uh, uh, B 1.0 C or 0 0.5 C, like it's a bunch of relationships. It's, 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 it's the neural network, right? It's the, um, our complex data structure. Um, but yeah, again, tensors, the, tensors is not, is an, is an operative word. You have, um, uh, and, and my math is super weak, but, um, uh, vectors are like a list and tensors are like lists of lists, right? So it's multi-dimensional arrays is essentially what we're talking about. So the, these, these are, these safe tensors are multi-dimensional arrays that represent the, the data model essentially. Um, all right, and then so this is this is stability AI. Um, moving on, uh, we have uh, an example of Citiv AI. Uh, and again, these are all free to download. These are very large. This is the primary uh, checkpoint that I recommend. There's there's three that I call out that are very good. Uh, two are kind of variations of the same thing, uh, but these two are really good. Um, but if if you if you download only one. Uh, Dream Shaper. Dream Shaper has really good for a bunch of things. You're seeing a lot of humanoids, but there's also cars, spaceships, all kinds of things. Just really, really good. And what you can see with these pictures, hopefully, is a sense of quality, right? So you're not just getting arbitrary things, you're getting good things. Um, what Citiv AI is really great at uh, is that when you click on a reference images, they almost always show you what the prompt was. Um, they'll show you a number of things. They'll show you what type of model is this. Okay, this is a checkpoint. If it was a LoRa, I would say LoRa. Um, there's a few of those um, kind of categories. Uh, and then enough text for you to recreate uh, that image to some degree. You never recreate it exactly. Um, it, there's some other configuration steps here which sort of match what we have. And, and that difference of sort is where you don't match it exactly. But this kind of gets you really close. If you want to you have something that generally is about what you're seeing here. It gives you a good starting point. Um, the other really important thing uh, with these, uh, uh, like the checkpoints and the LoRa's is that if you look at the main documentation, uh, they tend to have guides and best practices. And, and you do want to follow the best practices. Um, there, there may be key terminology you should use, or a lot of times checkpoints will represent uh, recommend certain embeddings to improve things. So like, we, re we really recommend you use this hand fixing LoRa, uh, you know, this one right here. And like, probably they know what they're talking about. Um, so again, that's one of the advantages of these. Civit AI is not the only ecosystem. There's a bunch of them, um, but this is the one that uh, um, I'm familiar with and, and it's pretty good. Um, again, with Dream Shaper, we want version eight. Um, just no, no reason to go to old stuff. If, if nine was out, I would use nine. Just, just use whatever the latest version is. Um, all right. And then, um, comfy UI, when you get into comfy UI space, um, there is no website for comfy UI. Everything in comfy UI world, because it's open source is basically GitHubs. Um, so every, so comfy UI is a GitHub. This is an add on, uh, for comfy UI. It's a GitHub as well. So, uh, you find out these things organically, which I, I have to say is, is not great, uh, but it's, it's, it's okay. You, you, you can learn a lot from uh, YouTube videos and, and uh, I'm, I'm finding a lot, like I follow like people on LinkedIn and, and they, they, they'll link to how they did stuff. So um, the project structure is super important for Comfy UI. Comfy UI, again, it is modular, node-based, extendable uh, and Therefore, how do you extend it is you need to follow some sort of form of sanity. So let's take a look at that. That's really important to understand. So I'm going to go into the Comfy UI project uh, right here. Uh, and um, there's really only a few things you actually care about. Um, models is the main one that you care about. And this all these are all empty folders provided to you by default when you get the repo. And this is where you put those things you download. So there's one called LoRa's, right? And so those LoRa's that I download, I put them here. Um, there are 
embeddings, I put embeddings here. Uh, upscaler models, here's the VAEs. I put the VAEs here. Um, so it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it's just something to be aware of. This is how you work with it. You, you download these things that I'm telling you to download. You put them in the folder called the thing, right? And so those headings, just to be very explicit, those headings are what these are. These represent the names of the, uh, the folders. Um, there is one other one though. So I'm, again, I'm inside Comfy UI models. The only other one that's really important uh, off the bat is this custom nodes. Custom nodes are where you put the software add-ons uh, that, that do something with the Comfy UI um, core app. Uh, these tend to be like adding a node, for example, uh, a new type of node. Uh, there is only one that uh, is really important that I, uh, I'll call out uh, a little bit later in the talk, but um, that's, that's just what to be aware of. Uh, I'll, just a preview, it's the Comfy UI Manager uh, add-on. This is the most important one. And you have to download it from GitHub and you have to put it right there. Uh, and then when you launch and reload uh, uh, Comfy UI, it'll, it'll auto-detect it. It'll auto-detect it, it'll auto-load it. Um, everything's magical once you put it in the right place. Um, all right, so let's continue. All right, now um, I have to call out the real pain point with Comfy UI. You probably saw that when I was running it, it was really instantaneous and fast, but installing it is the gotcha. Um, installing it the first time, if you've never done anything like this before, is very challenging. Uh, expect two to three hours plus just on installation and troubleshooting. But if you do this, your life's a lot better. Um, the first thing is you have to install a CUDA toolkit. CUDA toolkit's basically a driver. It installs NVIDIA stuff. Uh, and basically it, it lets you, it's, 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 essentially it's a software package to make best use of your GPU. Um, so you're installing this software package, essentially a driver. For your, for your GPU um, that you can use there. Um, be very aware of what version you're using. Um, all of our talks are using CUDA 11.8. Maybe you can see in this picture, there's also 12.1. Uh, theoretically, that would work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it might have conflicts with some of the other stuff that we're doing, uh, which is like this other project for training LoRa's. Uh, doesn't work with 12.1, I think. In any case, um, be very aware of what CUDA you're, you're picking. You have to kind of commit uh, which version, and there's only two at this time. Um, then follow the instructions for the um, manual install of Comfy UI. Of course, there is a Comfy UI GitHub. This is the main place you go to install and, and get um, Comfy UI. Um, follow along. I recommend the um, manual install. It'll help you in upgrading uh, over time, which becomes very important. Um, now, install Anaconda. <laughs> what is Anaconda? Anaconda is a, uh, a way of working with Python primarily where it creates a standard set of packages and a standard version of Python for those standard set of packages. So like uh, for a long time, Anaconda was like frozen at uh, Python 3.10. And even though there's like Python 11, maybe even Python 12 now, I don't know. Like, but it, it stayed at 3.10 because that's what it was good at. Uh, technically, you can get other versions. But the point with Anaconda is it freezes it and provides a cohesive uh, uh, set of libraries. Um, it just makes your life a lot easier. Now, uh, it's basically running a virtual environment. It's a type of virtual environment for Python. Um, it is, however, separate from this other thing that we also need, which is uh, 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 VN, this thing, this thing down here. So that's, that's a traditional Python virtual environment. Um, you want both. Now, the alternative to using Anaconda is running Python on your host operating system. I wasted hours trying it. Maybe you can get it working. I'm not saying it's impossible. But what I am saying is that every time you change something, you have to reinstall um, you know, 10 gigabytes of stuff. So it's very slow to iterate. You're better off doing it this way, um, in my opinion. Um, so do that. Uh, uh, create a virtual environment. The purpose of a virtual environment in Python world is to 
uh, isolate where you're installing your packages, like your, your, your uh, pip install libraries, you know, just isolating that. So basically we're creating a very isolated specific environment. It does consume a lot of disk space because you are downloading that 10 gigabytes per uh, application. But in, in generative AI, you have to throw disk space at things like the base model is six gigabytes. Uh, the add-ons you install are 10 gigabytes. All said and done, uh, you need about 20 gigabytes of disk space just to play around. Uh, as low as 10, but at least, uh, at least 20 would be recommended. Uh, and then you install um, PyTorch. PyTorch is the thing that uh, uses CUDA. Uh, if anybody follows the stock market, NVIDIA stock is through the roof. We're all hearing how they're like this massive company. This is why, because AI has standardized around libraries that are accelerated with the CUDA framework. The CUDA framework is proprietary to NVIDIA. So nobody else has a fair advantage uh, at this time the way that NVIDIA has. So um, there are, um, as, as, I, as I've mentioned before, you can theoretically run AMD graphics cards for this, uh, but I haven't tested it. And when they, it says it only works on Linux. So I, I can't, that's all I can say about it. Generally, most people are using NVIDIA graphics cards. Um, and so there you, those, those, are, those are big gotchas. Um, gotchas on performance. Um, you, need a, you need a gaming laptop. You know, you need something powerful. Um, most people's uh, office laptops aren't going to cut it. Uh, to put this into a number, you need a GPU with at least eight gigabytes of memory. Um, that's what I use, and I would characterize it as on the low end. Uh, what you probably want is 16 to 32 gigabytes. Some of the models require 64, but those are like, you know, that's crazy people stuff. You don't need to worry about that. But if, if you want like a, to not be locked in, um, 16 to 32 is, is a healthier, if you're going to buy like a new AI system and spend your, you know, $3,000 or whatever, um, do that. But at least, at least 8 gigabytes. You, you, you can be functional at 8 gigabytes. The GPU memory is one of the largest bottlenecks. I want to make that very clear. What that means is that you, uh, there's a lot of models. If your GPU memory is too small, you just can't even open the model. You try to open it, it crashes. You have no recourse. You can't even run it on your CPU. It's just the software doesn't work. So um, if you don't have a good graphics card, there is no way to do what we're going to show you tonight, right? You have to have um, somewhat of a modern NVIDIA graphics card, at least eight gigabytes, um, which, you know, it's everything in the last like five, six, seven years, something, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, you need a modernish graphics card. Um, the other thing is you want to set your power to uh, your CPU and your graphics and your power to maximum performance. This is energy hungry and it will exponentially slow down if you're on like battery saver mode. Don't do it. Max everything out, throttle it, floor it. Uh, it, it will save you time and there's a lot of, this is very time intensive. Um, and be, be aware of which CUDA version. Um, so I wanted to just like, this is me maxing what it means for me. Like these are two different profiles. I put my system on turbo mode. Uh, I change my power setting to best performance and I keep it plugged in. If, if I run this on battery, it, it takes three times longer. So, you know, again, if you're, if you're running on a, a slim i7 with, uh, or no, actually I'm on, a, I'm on a slim Ryzen with uh, only eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, it's like, uh, you you want to max your performance because it really does matter. Um, and then just a, a quick note on how maintenance. Um, everything in Comfy UI, because it, everything is associated with a GitHub project, which is frequently updated, you install everything with Git. Don't download the zip. And this is very important because uh, things break. In about two months, all a Comfy UI won't be able to work with a node anymore, or, or a new node will come out and it just won't work. You want to download from uh, Git using Git version control so that you can update with the projects. That's actually really important. I've had things break, and then the only way to fix it is to update it. Um, so if you use version control, it will preserve your file structure. Imagine you've, you've put all your LoRa's into the right place, all your VAEs, all, all these different things you've downloaded, um, You know, maybe 30 or 40 files in all the different folders. Um, 
the version control will let you overwrite all the other stuff and leave those things you've downloaded alone. Um, so don't use zip, use the git for downloading. And, and that also goes for every other um, module that you put in there. It's generally best practice to use git. Now, there is one module that is the difference between pain and victory, uh, and that is Comfy UI Manager. Because Comfy UI Manager, what it does is it will find nodes that you're missing and it'll install them for you. Um, so you, you, it's very common when you're starting off and you download like, oh, this YouTuber said use this JSON file to do this cool automation pipeline. You open it up and eight, eight, eight out of 10 of the nodes are like unknown to the system. Um, and figuring that out, especially when you're a beginner, is super painful. Um, however, with this uh, plugin, there is like a GUI for um, finding those and, and, and doing that manually. So uh, this is the only time that you have to manually put an add-on. The add-on goes into this Comp UI um, uh, nodes folder. Uh, which is, uh, again, it's inside the project, this custom nodes and this comfy UI manager. You get it from the Git, you put it here, and then from that point forward, you can use a UI for almost every one of the most common uh, nodes. Um, so that's the only one you have to do manually, putting it in the right folder and everything else after that is nice magic. Um, all right, so this is, this is what you get by adding that add-on, is this button here, Manager. Without the add-on, that doesn't exist. With the add-on, this shows up. And what's this other thing? Install missing custom nodes. That's your best friend. Uh, your second best friend is this one below it, Update All. Um, again, things can break, get out of date, Update All. Um, but just, just getting it alone for this Install Missing Custom Nodes, that's, that's, that's your sanity, do that. All right, so I wanna give you, like one of the things about this crazy wild west comfy UI ecosystem is that uh, you have to learn how to troubleshoot. So I wanna, I wanna work through an example of that. So we're gonna be over here. I'm going to go into the project that is on GitHub. There's this broken workflow that I wanna call out. And it looks right. Um, uh, I don't remember exactly what it does. I think it's maybe an animation. Uh, workflow, but let's go ahead and run it. Oh no, big red thing when I clicked run. Um, and what's great about uh, this is that it generally does show you which nodes are failing. You may recall that when we ran a successful one, there were green boxes that kind of showed you where it was processing. So it knows where it's breaking. And in this case, it's saying, you know, missing a model name, something dot uh, pickle, CPK, whatever, whatever. So that's, that's this, right? So when you download from your favorite YouTuber or blog, you know, a JSON file, a lot of these will be missing. You have to learn how to troubleshoot that. One of the pro tips, of course, just take that name, Google it, see if you can download it from Hugging Face or Civ AI. Um, in my case, if I just switch it to this other one, and hey, does that work? Now I run it, yep, it's running. Um, so <laughs> stuff like that, that's, that's like troubleshooting. Like you just have to learn how to deal with that. Um, I'm not gonna run this whole animation, it takes a while, but uh, that's, that's showing um, life skills that you need in this ecosystem. All right, so now we're gonna get to the fun stuff, which is the demo sequence. Um, the, we're gonna go through a bunch of things, AI generate, image generation, using a LoRa, using multiple LoRas, masking, uh, masking with depth maps, upscaling, text to video, text to video with LoRa's, and video upscaling. Um, so let's go ahead and jump on in. Um, I'll be in uh, browser-based mode for a while now. Uh, and again, these are all in the Git repo, which is going to save you a lot of time when you're trying to get set up. Yes. Uh, uh, quick question I have about the work flow. Yeah. Okay, are you able to configure that on the side? Yes. Yes. We'll do that. Um, all right, so this is um, starting up very simple, basic image generation. Um, go ahead and open and load. This is what you get. Um, now you have options of checkpoints. Uh, again, the two that I really recommend are the Dream Shaper 8. That's an absolute reality. 
Um, Dream Shaper 8 is well-rounded. It's the most well-rounded one I've seen. Absolute Reality is really good at photorealism. Um, so whatever, whatever you're really trying to emphasize there. Um, fundamentally, you have a, a negative prompt. Um, the way these things work is they're snappable. Um, so you can, you can, you can like right click, add node. Um, there are a bunch of things. Uh, one of the cool things is if you select a node and release an empty space, it will recommend some compatible nodes that you might consider. But basically, you know, this is, you're, you're, this is a dynamic thing. Um, it's normally pretty intuitive how things should connect. Imagine a flow and there's color coding. Um, we're, we're not going to work with Laura's right now, but essentially from the checkpoint, we're going to our prompts. From our prompts, we're going to some kind of uh, you know, magical engine doing the stuff. Uh, this is where we're configuring a seed. There's a number of properties here that you're going to want to experiment with. Uh, steps is a big one. Um, generally, steps involves the iterative, iterative generation of the AI. Again, um, you have this, the, the counterbalance to algorithms where one is saying, is this, is this a cat? And the other one's saying, no, that's not a cat. Steps is basically how many iterations of that do you want to go through? And generally, the more steps you do, the higher resolution in, in big air quotes something will be. It'll be nicer. There can be diminishing returns early, though, and, and it's not always like more steps is better. That's not true at all because a lot of steps, maybe it starts to introduce some weird artifacts. Like now there's spaceships in the sky and there's stars when it's daylight out, you know. It's not always more is not always better in, in this, but you know, um, no less than eight, um, you know, uh, I would say 12 to 15 is a good sweet spot. 20 is like when you want something kind of HD. Um, I'm not gonna get into all these other ones. There's a bunch of sampling methods. Uh, my, my pro tip is use what's in the examples or find uh, YouTube videos or blogs and just recreate um, what they have. There's a lot of nuance here. The best thing to do is to play around, put time into it, and 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 learn, uh, and just yeah, that's, that's that's what I did. Um, all right, so now let's talk about Alora. So Alora, as you may recall, is a style, right? So what are we talking about? And the best way is let's look at some Loras you can download um, from that sit of AI. Uh, let me start with. Neo futuristic. This is my favorite one. I use this a lot. Uh, if you look at this, it's it's any arbitrary prompt you want, but it's kind of like robotic, right? It's 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 it. There's something about the style that's cohesive, right? And this is something that you can apply to your models. So let's take a look at that and let's do that. So again, look at the documentation. Uh, they say you must use the trigger word neotech. Okay, so I'm going to copy that. Uh, let's go back to our workflow. Uh, let's do um, cat on a fence in our positive. Uh, I will do comma neotech. I'm going to stick with Dream Shaper. What I'm going to do is introduce a Laura, and a Laura is a filter. Where you're going to want to put this is before your text prompt. Uh, and I'm just going to like reroute things. So this, this Laura feeds both a positive and negative prompt. Um, the model now goes here. And then I'm going to get rid of this other one. And the model goes from here into this, this uh, sampler. Uh, so we have basically interjected an intermediate, right? And the intermediate I'm going to pick is this Neo Future Tech. Um, there are a couple things about Lauras. Uh, they're kind of, I, I have to be honest, they work a little bit different, Laura to Laura. It's not elegant. But um, essentially, the model strength is dialing up or down. Normally, a sweet spot is 0 0.8 to 1. Um, so let's just go ahead and run this just to, just to get a baseline. Oh, I got I to gotta do the clip. So I do clip here. Clip in, clip out. OK, close this. Q. So the Q is running. Let's just, let's just see what we get. Cat on a fence, neo-futuristic. OK, sort of. Um, now, um, one of the things that Laura's 
do tend to have is um, a lot of LORAs are presented like this. You have square bracket LORA um, colon, oh gosh, I need a reference. Uh, I think it's like, I don't know. I'm 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 probably butchering this. I'll I'll, I'll there's I have there's, I have other examples where we'll get this right. Actually, I have the example right. No. Uh, where do I have the example? Uh, oh oh I know where to have it. Uh, you have it in the. Sometimes you have uh it in the descriptors here. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, this one. Okay, so this, this is a typical LoRa syntax. You put this in one of the prompts. So what you're going to want to do basically is have both. You want to have your load Nora, <laughs> load Laura um, here, and you're going to want to have it here. And now when you have your load your Laura here, um, this is supposed to be a modifier of the strength. This strength value and this strength value are the same thing. But the way Comfy UI works, it's a little bit weird. I've seen that you're able to modify it in both places. Um, so I don't, I don't know what that means. But basically, uh, when you have more strength, you're upping how much that is affecting your image. So this is more robotic and futury than the last one was by a little bit. Um, I, think you, I think my rule of thumb is that you have to have the keyword here in any format but most of the strength is modified by the slider. I, I'm not sure if this has value. It may or may not. I haven't been able to really confirm that. I normally modify the strength over here. So that's just, uh, you know, again, a little bit quirky. Um, so again, this is, this is a Laura. There's another Laura, though, just to give you guys more flavor. This is a really cute Laura. This is a Laura for making things that look like little plastic figurines. Very niche. I don't know why you would want to do this, but it is super cute. So let's do that. So um, just for reference, by the way, um, a Laura like this, this is pretty fancy. This Laura is um, 400 uh, megabytes. Let me, let me just go ahead and take a look. This, that Laura is, so the, the, the plastic figurines is 400 megabytes, just for reference. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll actually, we'll look at everything. So the, the model for the checkpoint, where am I? So models, models, checkpoints, Dream Shaper 8, uh, two gigabytes, very lean, very lean, two gigabytes, um, but a very well-rounded one. The Laura, the cute collectible, 400 megabytes, uh, the Neo Future, only 147. Um, so there's a lot of variability there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, what, what's the difference between checkpoint and Laura? It's not, it looks like you can combine. So, the difference between a checkpoint and a Laura. A checkpoint is representative of a full corpus of images. Um, it is it is stable diffusion, but better quality, right? So, again, going back to going back to Dream Shaper eight. Dream Shaper 8 represents a bunch of types of images, but all of a certain quality. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just, rule of thumbs, it's, it's, just, it's just the starting point that you want to use, uh, frankly. And you can just explore. There's a bunch of them that you can explore uh, to kind of narrow in. And then it's just trial and error. Allura represents a specific style or concept. So the plastic figurine is always going to be plastic figurine. It's really drilled down. Uh, so LoRa's are smaller than a checkpoint. They represent something that you're filtering for. Um, so let's 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 see if we can um, get that demoed here. Um, all right. So we'll we'll change this to cute collectible. Um, let me just take a quick look at the figurine. So they have this LoRa cute collectible tag. Uh, and you, if you read it, they recommend 0 0.8 to one. So that's what we'll do. Uh, Comfy UI. So let's do. Um, <laughs> um, let's do uh, Spider Man. Uh, cute collectible. Zero point eight. Oh, this, this one's one point zero point eight. 
this one's 1.4. It's a little bit stronger. Uh, let's run another one, 0 0.8. So that one, that one's a little bit better. Um, let's let's change the seed around. Try a different seed. You know, so probably what I would do is I would pair this one. I'm noticing the hands are messed up. There's a lot I like, but the the hands are messed up. Let's let's boost the. Yeah, let's boost the impact of the model. Let's make it more plastic model-y, going from 0 0.8 to 1 in strength, same seed. It's a little bit more plastic-y. I wouldn't call it ground bake breakingly more. Let's boost it a little bit more to, I don't know. Um, yeah, so probably you should be changing it in both. Like I said, from, I'm not exactly clear how it works, but um, I feel like the strength is dominated by the one on the left, but it's it's a, a requirement to have the language here on the right. Maybe they both have an effect. It's, it's not 100% clear to me. No, no. So the Laura is this cute collectible. Um, so, all right. Let us look at something else. I think I'm going to cheat and see if I had a really cute one. If I can find it really quick. Yeah. Okay. So um, I trained Alora just to just to give you guys a, a preview of where we're going to go later. Um, or, or maybe time permitting is um, I trained a Laura. Uh, called Broody Sp Superman, and it was only eight images, and it's it's less than I would recommend. But I was I was trying to find like pictures of I don't know, kind of like serious Superman. So I called it Broody Superman. Um, and so this is a style. If I if I want things to be like my Broody Superman, um, this rep. Uh, th uh, is this the right one? Uh, you prompt. Uh, okay, so I need. Okay, this isn't the full one. All right, so I'm gonna. I trained this, and it came out with this single file. I, I turned those eight images into a Laura. This is the Laura. I'm gonna take that Laura file, put it in the Laura files. Uh, I have to reload um, Comfy UI. Now it's a selectable option. Um, so this is Cat in the Hat. This is not the demo that I think I had wanted, but we'll we'll see. Okay, so this is Cat in the Hat as a broody Superman, sort of, sort of. Um, what I want to do though is I actually want to chain these. So let me do um, a Laura into a Laura. Um, so this Laura now I want to modify it so that this is the cute collectible. Uh, and let's see if we can, what happens when we add this. Cat in the hat into a cute collectible into a broody Superman. Okay, yeah, this is this is not the demo that shows this very well. Let me let me drop this four is pretty high. I must have been testing things. Let's see if we can get it. Okay. Uh well, anyway, um, let's make that a little bit more broody. See, see where we're going if we do boost that. Not super broody. It's a very iterative yeah, this is a, this is. A, yeah, you you have to play with it. Um, I had one that was pretty good. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll find it um, in a bit, but. Um, the premise here is that you can do Laura's into Laura's, uh, and um, you know you, you just have to dial it in. I, in fact, I think what I need to do is, I, I think I need to put the um, the tags. I think I'm missing the tags, and that that's actually a big deal. So let me do the um, collectible, um, and then let me do uh, so bro the broody uh, broody uh, broody Superman is called that. Um, and then let's try it again with that cue. 
Okay. So that's interesting, a little bit better. Let me dial these back down just to see. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to take my loss and 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 walk, but in any case, you kind of you kind of get the idea um, that you know Laura's into Laura's. You need to have this. You need to have these. Um, sorry, it's not a great example. Let me uh, let me just do one last quick test. Getting rid of Broody Superman is a bad Laura. It's a bad Laura because I only used um, low quality images and only less than fifteen of them. Um, so it's it, it never was that good uh, to begin with. All right. Well, uh, all right, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, let us continue to um, masking. So masking is really important. So let me, let me go ahead and load. Uh, I'm going to go back to our workflows. We have uh, masking an image here. So same thing. Um, now, there's a new node here called load image. Uh, you can actually copy paste an image uh, or, or grab one. So what I'm going to do is, um, depending on if you have this set as preview or there's another one called um, save, if you save a node, it saves it to your uh, Comfy UI outputs folder. So I'm just going to grab one uh, that we've done historically. Let's say this one. Um, let me see. Make sure, yeah, let's say, OK. Uh, I'm just going to take that copy paste. <laughs> now, this is this is just modifying an image, but what a mask will let you do, you right click, you go to um, uh, uh, you right click, you go to um, can open in mask editor. There is like something that lets you change the size of your cursor uh, and you're going to select something. So I'm going to select this and say, uh, I'm select that uh, and save. Uh, you say it's, it's grayed out there. That's what it's going to touch. It's not going to touch anything else. So now my prompt is, uh, uh, so it was a, uh, let's do a red lid. Q. All right, so th there's a red lid, okay? Um, so this is, this is um, touching, uh, uh, retouching. Um, there's a really cool other one, uh, which is uh, masking with depth matching. So here's an example, and I've already have it masked out. Um, why, why don't, what, we'll, we'll use the same one. So let me, let me just paste this in. Um, one of the things is, um, all right, so if I, uh, what, I'm, what I want to do, I'm going to make my prompt a glass cap. So it's like, I love everything about this, but mm, I don't like this metal cap. I wish it was glass. Um, if, I, if I do my masking now, um, I'm going to select this, you know, get it just about right. It doesn't have to be exact. Um, and glass cap. And then Q, um, there's a, a few things here. There's these Midas depth maps, and there's a depth map and a normal map. And you see here what those maps are. Um, they they kind of represent, as you would imagine, depth, um, edge detection. You know, there's a little bit of mathematics there. It, it's really capturing the form. And what this will help you do is apply your um, suggestion taking into account that form. So this is a more subtle and nuanced style of masking. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to keep the shape of the original. So like, I love the shape. I just want it to be glass. This is how you do that. If you did it the other way without the depth matching and you said, give me a glass cap, maybe it gives you a triangle, right? It just dramatically goes in a different direction with the shape. Um, this one's going to preserve the shape. Uh, and there's, there's a, um, that's this control net. This control net is a modifier of these advanced settings. And you can adjust the strength of how loyal to that form do you want it to be with this strength right here. Really follow this shape or go in my own direction with it. 
Um, it's a subtle art kind of thing, but um, you know, this is okay. It's maybe it's not glass, 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 but it's following. It's almost the exact identical shape as the original. Um, so this is in the realm of deep fakes. Um, this is how you're going to modify subtle aspects of something to become something else. Um, really, really uh, good stuff uh, for tweaking. Um, now upscaling. Oh my gosh, an error in my demo. Aha! This was planned. So um, I wanted to show you a, a real applied use case of using this manager. You're gonna you're gonna run into this issue where you download something and you get it like, oh my god, this node doesn't exist. What do I do? Well, let's go ahead and install missing nodes, um, and um, and go ahead and install that. Uh, what it's going to do in the background is just get download. Well, let's actually watch the um, the prompt thing here. Um, so uh, yeah, this will just download the the module. It'll install it. Um, we'll have to reload. No fuss, no muss. So it just says, yeah, go ahead and restart. Okay, restarting, reconnecting. So the whole server will reboot. And at this point, I can reload. And there's our missing module right here. So again, most brilliant module ever for troubleshooting. This is upscaling. So you still have your positive and negative prompt. Um, we are introducing an upscaler, though. Uh, an upscaler, the most important one there is upscale by. So this is, uh, let's let's set this to our, our example image. Uh, open, no, uh, let me see if I can just uh, go back here. We'll copy, we'll paste. This image is this actual size. This is 512 by 512 actual pixels. We're gonna do a times two multiplier now, what's going to happen is it's going to use this checkpoint to, to, to fill in the missing dots. You, you, you imagine you're working at the raster data. You expand it. There's invisible space there. It's going to interpolate what those invisible spaces should be. So it's going to generate arbitrary new things. If you have a picture of trees, uh, it'll, it'll add additional leaves, that kind of thing. Now, take a look at this. This is... Um, this is this is the original. This is the upscaled version. So it's prettier. It's like actually this is the actual version. So 100% scale, 100% scale. You'll see that there's more detail in the bark. It just literally invented things. Um, it's not perfect. They, there may be some artifacts like this bottom of this glass is is kind of missing over here. It's a little bit invisible. So it's not it's not perfect, but it does a really good job for almost every um, application I've seen. So you can kind of dial in. Um, some of the settings here that you would want to look at are um, denoise. Denoise has to do with how loyal to the original image do you want to be. Uh, and you kind of want a hybrid where you're loyal, but not too loyal. Um, and you kind of have to dial it in. Uh, if it's really introducing a lot of artifacts, become more loyal. Um, but if you're too loyal, it doesn't interpolate well, doesn't add that high resolution detail that you actually want it to uh, create de novo. So um, this is upscaling. I think upscaling is my favorite thing to do. Um, if you imagine you have uh, old images from back in the 90s and they're, they're, they're cool, but they're just not modern, they're not 4K, run them through this. It'll make it 4K for you. Um, also really cool, you don't need to enter positive and negative prompts. You can, you can modify the upscaling by introducing something novel, but don't, just run them with empty prompts. It'll do a really great job as is set up. I do wanna call out here though that the upscaler does need a VAE. <laughs> this is one of the specialized VAEs. Don't fully understand this one, uh, but it, it, it's really good for um, working with upscalers. And you know, I don't know. Again, you just, some, some examples you just use and run with it. Um, all right, uh, briefly, text to video. Um, so this, uh, you, you have a number of frames now. You, you can't go any less than 16. Uh, it corrupts below that, but you could, everything else is the same. So you have your, your checkpoint, your positive, negative. Um, there are some things about, uh, like there's these new things. 
you're introducing some models here. Um, uh, these have to, there's a high and a mid uh, in the, in the debt reference. This has to do with, do you prefer the, the do you prefer rapid motion uh, with a high amount of delta? So like I'm jumping and like I move really far. Um, that's going to be really good for a big change, but it could introduce a lot of like weird floppy artifacts along the way. If you want something smoother, you go with the mid uh, and the mid's going to give you the smoothest, but your arm's just not going to go as far. You're going to have like a, a less of a delta in the absolute change on the screen, but it is, it is technically smoother. Um, uh, so again, um, here, I guess our example is trees blowing in the wind. Um, you know, uh, these take actual time to process. Um, you Im imagine again that we are running 16 frames now. It has to do 16 things. Um, there is still a seed. I'll always use a fixed seed. Um, we're going to uh, preview the images here. And then you can actually set it as either a GIF. Um, I, I like MP4. You're, you're pretty safe with MP4. Uh, behind the scenes, FFmpeg doesn't really matter too much, but it, you can get a movie out of this is the bottom line. Um, so we'll let this run just a little bit to show you guys. Let's say I want to use Sora. Yes. Is there a way that we can do that? No. There is a big line in the sand between closed ecosystems and open ecosystems. This is open source. Um, now. Sora is better. I'm, no argue there. Sora is better, um, but this will catch up. That's the thing about stability AI. It will get there. It's just not there right now. Um, but again, it's, it's free. You have more control. So an emphasis on control is one of the things about this style. Um, all right, we're almost there. Again, this is why you got to have your, your specs on high. Um, it just takes time. Uh, let's see, other settings here. Um, so we talked about steps. Uh, sampler can be very nuanced. Uh, don't know too much about it. Okay, so now it's doing the decoding. So um, basically everything up until the decoder is like this imaginary uh, format. So this, these are the actual stills. Uh, and you can kind of see it's literally just creating frame by frame. Um, and I don't need to play, play, play because it actually creates that image for you here. Uh, so this is an MP4. You can download it, share it, whatever. Um, again, uh, video is, of course, more intensive. Um, you kind of have diminishing return after a certain number of frames, but you can, you know, a lot of people are doing like 400 frames or whatever. Um, I'm not going to run the next one, but I'll show you a few of these other ones. There is applying a LoRa to a video. So here's applying a filter. Uh, everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, so you can apply filters. You know, I want my Van Gogh styled video. Um, the next one, which I think is really cool, uh, pro tip, is um, text upscaling. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I want to move on for time reasons. Um, but if time after the talk, I'm happy to open that demo and run it. Um, here is um, an, running it into an upscaler. So if you imagine what's going on again, at this point we have those 16 frames. You know, the VA decoder has the 16 frames. We are then taking those frames, piping them into an upscaler, doing a whatever arbitrary upscale, and then taking that into our diff combined to create our MP4. So you can do um, 4K video. And the way you would do 4K video is you would do a bunch of maybe uh, 5, uh, 12 by 720 images. Uh, make sure you like where it is at the point of the preview, which it'll run in about uh, three minutes. Uh, and then wait for the upscaler to run, which will run in the order of like 10 minutes or you know however long. It's system, system dependent. But there's, there's, there's a noticeable increase uh, in the upscaling. It takes a lot longer because it has to do many, many, many steps with the upscaler. Um, but you know, you can do it. You can make 4K video out of text, uh, and you can take small images and small videos and make them large videos, all with pipelines. 
hopefully you guys get this, the intuitive sense here. Like I am proposing pipelines, but you can de novo create your own pipeline. So for example, this is text to video, but you could create video to video, video small resolution to video high resolution by just introducing like an, a, a video loader, uh, breaking out the frames, sending the frames on to your model and blah, blah, blah. So like you can innovate on pipelines and that's part of the point here with Comfy UI. Um, and then there's an alternate uh, upscaler, which I'll, I'll show you real quick. Um, let me see. Which one is which load? Okay, never mind. Um, not the emphasis I wanted. So I will continue. All right. So those are the main things. Um, I'm going to uh, leave it at there. I think we're about at time. Um, I will. I will kind of preview what the rest of my slides are. You can check these out online. There is a second project uh, for creating your own LoRa's. And again, LoRa's being the filters that have a, that represent a style, that's a very powerful part uh, of the process. Uh, I think of LoRa's as branding, right? So if I, when I release images, I almost always use uh, the uh, this one. Uh, and then when I have images I want to be kind of similar or thematically the same, I use one LoRa that I've custom created and every image that I ever create has that branding baked into it. Um, so that's that's one of the pieces. And, and, and just LoRa's are dirt simple to train. Um, the, the gist of it is you, you find your images, right? And have them be as high, you know, high resolution as you can, really representative of what you want, 15 to 30 images. You don't need that many. Um, here I'm doing it with uh, whatever this is, eight. You can, you can, you can recommend it 15 though. Um, when you're training it, there's one thing that you need to be aware of, which is the, um, the data structure that uh, the, they have to be in. Like when you train these datas, they have to be in a specific hierarchy. So I have a representation of that hierarchy here. Uh, workflows. Where did it go? I broke it. All right, let me see if I have that here, workflows. Yeah, training, I don't know what happened. I'll, I'll make sure this is in the latest version, but all right, so I have, I'll, I'll have another folder called training Alora. And starting from the data sets folder down, you have to follow a convention. So data sets, you put all your data sets. And so this is human level. You're just saying, these are all my data sets. This is saying, this is a data set. This is my, I want to make Marvel action figures data set. I'm going to spend my weekend doing that. Inside your data set, um, you have uh, each of the individual filters that you want. It's, it's really the keywords, right? So um, when I did Broody um, Superman, um, you put that here. It's, it's the, the naming convention of the folder matters here. Inside of the folder, you put your images. So let me let me go ahead and go to the um, uh, Broody Superman. So you see that. So the name of the data set is Broody Superman up here. Inside of that, I have one keyword, and you can have multiple keywords. So my keyword is Broody underscore Superman. This is what you actually put into the LoRa in the positive or negative prompt. The number in front of it represents the number of cycles during training. I wasn't super clear on that, but um, you can just use 20 or 30. I've seen those. Uh, and then you put pictures. Doesn't matter the, re the size, the aspect ratio. Um, the, the program takes care of that for you. Um, I have an image. So like, yeah, so there's your data set folder. It has to follow that structure. You could have one keyword here, another keyword there. Uh, there's an article here that has all the best practices. Um, this is the project, um, that Koya project. And basically you go to this Laura tab, you go to the training tab, you select the folder with the, the, the data set you want. Uh, and then at the bottom, there's a folder called train and that's it. As long as your images follow that data structure for the fo folders, you get, you get your Laura, your output is, um, is a safe tensors. Uh, which again we have in the uh, we have already put into the um, into the models, Laura's. This is 
this is our this is our Superman. Our 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 eight images turned into this nine megabyte um, filter, and we can use this filter going forward. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for how you can kind of brand your own stuff using this other project, uh, which is really cool. Um, all right. Um, so um, again. This is uh, a way of doing it. It's not as fancy as a lot of the Silicon Valley things, but it's more powerful. Um, it's rapidly changing though. One pro tip, look out for a, an update to um, the, the stable diffusion. There's a new style being trained called stable cascade. This is an example where you can kind of get a preview of it. Uh, this one's really good. Like if you just, if you don't want to download anything, you just go to this website, you use it. Um, it's, it's really good. Again, this is running on their um, GPUs. It doesn't have any of the pipelining, right? It will have the pipelining when they get this into Comfy UI. We're waiting on them to introduce nodes for this. Uh, that's, that's part of that open source ecosystem. Uh, but this is the next big thing. And, and this has quality very close to the, what we're getting out of Silicon Valley. So, um, you know, we, Comfy UI is not worse than Silicon Valley. It's just one or two months behind it as far as lag and, and, and it can get there and if you're good you can exceed silicon valley on a lot of things um, that's just the tip of the iceberg you can go in so many directions with this um, there's a there's a style of video production i didn't get into which is rigging you can rig a puppet and if you have a one picture of a human you can animate that human to follow your puppets and create a video so you know a picture of barack obama and he's waving or doing the you know the worm or something, uh, you can get that um, with other modules. There's just a huge ecosystem of really cool things you can do. Uh, yeah, well, Control Net, yeah, that's part of Control Net. Lets you do the wireframing. Control Net has a lot of um, modifiers that it lets you do. The depth map was one of the modifiers. The wireframing is another modifier. There's a bunch of different ones. Go forth, be creative. Um, uh, if you guys, just a, just a shill for my, for my startup for a second, I am doing a hardware software company that's doing uh, at-home network accessible storage devices. If you're a full stack developer in Python, uh, want to do a startup, talk to me. Um, thank you so much, and uh, I'll be around uh, after this for any discussions. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, uh, so the question was, can we demo a LoRa applied to a uh, applied to a video? So let me go back to a URL, and we will load text to video applying LoRa. Um, all right. So. Uh, let's do the neo futuristic one. I need the neo tech tag, um, and I will put that here. Hopefully, that works. Uh, you'll notice that I have these are the embeddings, these are like remove things, so remove things that are like worst quality. A lot of these are built into the checkpoint, so again, look at the references. Um, for what they might have out of the box, or or if you have other modules. So let's let's do. So this is a robotic toy dancing on a table. Um, let me. I clicked that twice. Let me cancel. Cancel. Q. And let's take a look. Most importantly, at the what's going on in the background. Um, when you first down. When you first run something like this, it will automatically download and cache models. So you, there's about a, like a it will download stable diffusion, which is like, I think it's like four, three gigabyte files and it'll cache it. It's a one-time thing, but be aware that the first time you run it, have a really good internet connection. After that, like I said, once you have everything in the right place, you've run every um, pipeline end to end at least once, get internet connected, then you can go offline and do whatever. Um, but the very first time you run it, you do need that internet connection. Let's see what it's doing. 
All right, any other questions? Can you have it uh, do the render and distribute it on the blog? Because right now it's doing 25 frames. If you're doing like 30 second video, I believe with Comfy UI, yes, you can. Um, what I what I know you can do is multi GPU. Um, so if you have a custom built rig with multiple GPUs in it, you can you can distribute your load. Um, I'd have to look a little bit closer at the cloud, um, but um, the short answer is yeah, I, th I think you can. So if like you so if you have like a if you have um, the cloud as a service, like a GPU as a service, can you use this for that? Uh, the question was, if you have cloud as a service, can you use this um, GPU as a service on the cloud? GPU on the ser as a service isn't exactly the terminology I would use. Um, but for example, what I would actually probably do is get a cluster machine that has high GPU numbers, right? Just, just get a traditional server, bunch of GPUs on that server, just run it on that high performance machine for a little bit. Um, as a service is where it's like, I, I don't know what that means, maybe. But um, all right, so this is our robotic dancing thingy using our filter. Uh, and then where is our movie? Here's our movie open image. So there's, there, that's applying a LoRa to a video. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. The question is, can it be run on something uh, less powerful but slower? The answer is no. <laughs> um, in theory, they say there's a CPU mode, but every time I tried CPU mode, it errored out. I think they in some of the nodes, there's a hard check for its CUDA. And if you just don't have it, it just won't let you proceed. In theory, yes, in theory. But the way these things are built is they don't perform or they just don't work unless you have the CUDA set up. So in practice, no. In theory, yes, but in practice, no. Uh, did you look into Photoshop Firefly, this new uh, like generative view? There is so much, so much going on. Um, yeah, Firefly, Photoshop Firefly, uh, AI in image editing, it does a lot of what we're doing. So the masking, right? The masking is a huge part of how to effectively do uh, AI because a lot of times you're 88% right, but the hand is wrong, right? You just need to tweak something. So a lot of this is getting a good workflow for masking. Um, you can do everything you can do in Photoshop, you can do in Comfy UI. So that's, that's one takeaway message. But the other takeaway message is in practice, depending on what you want to do, what I would actually recommend is find a specialty startup that does that thing. So there are companies or, or, or products like Sora. They, Sora does video, right? Go to them for a video. They don't do text uh, speech. They don't do speech. Other models do speech. Other models like Photoshop do image editing. Um, specialty products, um, they're always going to be best in class. They're just There's a lot of money flowing and there's a lot of innovation. They're going to be best in class for that thing. Uh, but you can do every single thing that industry is doing in Comfy UI for free. Uh, so it's kind of a cost question as well. Um, but there's nothing any of the Silicon Valley is doing that we can't do here. Um, there may be some newer models that don't have nodes yet, but those nodes are coming and they'll be out shortly. So Comfy UI is a good investment for still, even, even though a lot of our renders are like older generation, um, that's just because, you know, I, I haven't, kept up like four months as an eternity for uh, how, how fast these AI is moving. So it sounds like this is a good, it sounds like this is a good platform for, for uh, de-aging videos. Yes. You're talking about just literally making somebody look younger? Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good app. Uh, I'd have to find examples. I'm sure there's YouTube videos on that. Um, it's hard for me to be a de novo innovator um, because a lot of it is getting the filters right um, and those settings. Um, but there are really, really smart people on it. So I'm sure there is Comfy UI for de-aging. You just find a, an example and you replicate it. 
a lot of times what I have done in practice is they'll show it in the YouTube video. I'll pause the screen and recreate the nodes. Uh, and in particular, when recreating the nodes is getting those, uh, those settings right. It's, it's, the nodes are the easy part, but getting the settings right can be a make or break for, for getting the effect you want. And then I think we have a question over there. Let's see. Um, I'm just uh, curious if Comfy UI right now is uh, you know, like specific for just video or if other kinds of um, generative AI can also be incorporated, like audio eventually or uh, text. That's a good question. Um, I believe the, 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 the strict answer is yes, I believe you can go in other directions. It's, it's open source and people are going in weird directions. I will say the heart and soul of Comfy UI is essentially sta stable diffusion, which is essentially image and every direction you can go from image. Um, but I, I think I remember somebody doing something with audio. Um, it is not the main application for Comfy UI. Um, so you, you might be hard pressed to find good examples, but in theory, yes, you can. Um, but uh, we, we, I, 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 uh, it's not what it's primarily about. It's primarily about image and video and that ecosystem. Actually, kind of, can you, kind of similar to what he said. Uh, does it work for three D or for things like texture maps? Uh, it would work very well for texture maps. Um, 3D imply it depends what part of 3D. Um, there are other platforms that do 3D a lot better uh, than this, uh, but texture maps is a really good example. Um, 3D, um, I'd have to look. There's a lot of new work on 3D interpolation. So I saw one just today where it's a picture of a fire hydrant from one angle and a second angle, and then it just gives you the 3D model of all around it. Um, I believe this may be able to support that. Uh, and, and, and it, sh it should have the tooling for it. I'd have to look into examples for it, um, but I, I have a gut feeling Comfy UI has 3D model interpolation examples out there. It's not something I've played with myself. Um, but there are, again, there's Silicon Valley websites that do that kind of interpolation. <laughs> Keep in mind that my perspective of the ecosystem is we're still in the art mode for AI. So we get things that look right. We're not yet at the AI for CAD. We're getting closer to CAD, which is a uh, parametric design of like tools and like, like getting the dimensions just right for engineering. We're not there yet. We have things that look good, but aren't scientifically valid. But we're getting a lot closer to having scientifically valid 3D models and data and uh, structures. But that's uh, you know we'll see where we are in a year. <laughs>